If you like steak, tofu, or you prefer a simple piece of haddock, welcome. If you feel broken or beautiful this morning, welcome to you. If you struggle with addiction or you support someone who struggles with addiction, welcome to you. If you're a believer, a questioner, or a questioning believer, welcome to church. As we enter into a space for contemplation and reflection, let us know that no matter where we are physically, God is surely with us. Let's listen for God's still speaking voice in our introit. Please join me. Oh, this is still on. Yep. Okay. Please join me for the call to worship as it is printed in our bulletin. We come to listen for your voice this hour, Divine Shepherd. Grant us a deeper understanding of our belovedness. We want to feel so close to your spirit in this hour that we will move with courage and faith in all we do. Grant us your grace on this very day that we may carry out your service. We come in humble prayer and praise this hour. Hear us, Holy One. Grant us the heights of joy and your blessed peace. Hear your people join in sacred song for your love's sake.
We invite you to remain standing if you wish. We're going to enter a time of passing of the peace. As we pass the peace, let's remember that some people are more or less comfortable with physical contact. If you don't want people near you, we have a sign in our church, not unlike many other faith communities. It's a peace sign. In this sanctuary, the peace sign also means, please stay away from my personal bubble. So, greet one another with signs of God's peace. Okay, everyone, I'm going to invite you to slowly move back to, towards your seat. I know it's exciting to see people, not on the screen, yay! If you're at home, we want to make sure you feel enlivened to also give people peace virtually on, on your phone, or uh, perhaps you want to write a note, you could write, peace be with you, you could write, God be with you, you could simply write, Emmanuel, God be with you. God is with us. So if you're at home, use your phone, use Facebook Messenger, or grab a piece of paper and figure out a nice thing to write on a note. And if you have an actual physical note, make sure you make a plan for how you're going to deliver it. Maybe placing it under a windshield wiper at the store or putting it in someone's screen door. We invite you to join us in the order of service. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Please join me in the unison gathering prayer. Holy One, we humbly come before you this morning, seeking peace and hoping to be inspired. As we hear notes, melodies, and your sacred word, let us gain a deeper sense of how we belong in your love and care. Center our spirit around your love this hour. Let us know presence is persistent and that we may count on your constancy. We pray all this for love's sake and in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to join us in moments of confession. Gracious God, some of our wrongs feel too hard to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. God, we pray that you will forgive us and that we will be aware of your forgiveness. Those things that our lips tremble to name, what our hearts cannot bear, and that which ke might keep us from professing your love, let us turn these over to you. God, hear your humble people in silence and prayer. Holy One, set us free from a past we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can and will be changed. Grant us grace to grow more and more into your holy love. Amen. God, whose love knows no ends, we want to be compelled to spread kindness and peace throughout the world. Let us see that in our struggles, you join us and let us feel your presence. May we see how long to be with us always. Let us recall the promises of your holy words and the covenant before us, the same one.
I wonder if any younger people would like to come and join in this front area. And if you're younger, if you didn't know, this is called the chancel. So we'll start with a vocabulary lesson today. Please come forward to the chancel if you wish. Maris, you not into it this morning? Okay, I get it. You're going to do some playing while we talk. You can, you can share from back there, too, if you want. It's okay. Take your time. Okay. So I, I'm going to sort of give it back, give, give the service back to you this morning during this time, okay? I know that happens sometimes even when I don't intend for it to happen, but I'm, inten I'm intending on it this time. I want you all to teach us about something I haven't covered just yet this fall, um, which seems like I missed part of the important time of the year to do it. I, I would like to know what fall means to you, the season of fall that we are in. <sighs> They're changing, yeah. Mm hmm yeah. What else is going on? What makes the trees change? You probably know some of the science, don't you? No, what's the, what's the main thing that relates to how we feel when we walk outside that relates to why those leaves? Let's let Wesley answer. But thank you. That's right. It starts to get colder, right? Yeah. And then what does that mean like for what we wear? And then what 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 Maris was giving us a very important lesson in photosynthesis. So if you can't hear, can you say that last part again? Uh, it, it was, it's the trees, the trees, the trees change color to, because the, um, it gets cold, the, and then when, the, once it gets cold enough, the leaves fall off, and then once, and then, but for your house plant, if it, if it gets if it Okay, so the house plants are a little different because they're inside, right? So the thing that the Maris was telling us is that before Maris was rudely interrupted, I might add, is that the trees know what is going on, right? They feel the temperature getting colder and they know they have to do this thing, right? What happens if they don't do that thing called photosynthesize, what happens? Yeah, I think eventually, they might not fall down the first year, probably depends on how big and old the tree is, right? I'm sure someone here besides me knows, Wayne probably knows. Oh, he's really cracking up, because Wayne knows about trees. But um, I think if a tree doesn't do the photosynthesis thing, like do the photosynthesis dance and the, you know, all of that, then what's gonna happen is they're going to become unhealthy is it right, Wayne? Yes, that's right. If they don't photosynthesize, then they will not stay healthy, and they will eventually die. They will die, which is not always bad. Sometimes it needs to happen, right? But sometimes they could make it, and otherwise they didn't for some different reasons. Yes, Tessa. Uh, so if the tree fell down and died, we wouldn't be able to breathe. Oh my gosh, what an important lesson. If the trees all fall down and they all die, then we will not be able to breathe. So that is a very important lesson. And the main thing that you taught us that I want everybody in here to remember, the lesson I haven't gotten to yet this fall that I have to make time for it before the season is over, is that we have to, like the trees, we have to change, right? Whether we want to or not, whether we're good at it or not, whether it's comfortable or not, change is just something that happens. And that is what fall is about. And 
I don't think we have time to cover it, but it, God has a lot to say about it. So I'm going to give you one scripture. It's a, such a great scripture that I have, it all, I have it all over my office at my home. It's 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it says, Therefore, if someone is in Christ, in Jesus, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Okay? We always have to recreate and change. That's part of what God is inviting us to. And Maris will get the last word. Um, the, so when the tr so uh, uh, we will when the I forget. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. You know what? Sometimes I forget what I'm saying when I'm standing up here, and it can be so frustrating. But that's okay. You'll have another opportunity. Do you need to say one more thing, Tessa? Oh my gosh, that is so true. Fall is really beautiful. So we're going to say a prayer together real quick. If you want to, you can repeat after me, but you don't have to. It's totally up to you. So we'll say, Dear God, thank you for the beautiful trees. Thank you for inviting us to change. And thank you for always being there for us. Amen. All right. Thank you for helping me. That was a hard one, so I appreciated your help. We're going to sing for you as you go away to church school, okay? Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for the people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Gracious God, let the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you. Let us find you both as a rock and redeemer. We pray that your spirit moves between words and hearing. Amen. I specifically encouraged and asked Natalie not to read the um, Hebrew Bible reading this morning, not because it isn't super interesting, and I didn't wish I could preach on both of the texts because they're both great. Uh, we just, we have a special speaker today, and I wanted to honor the text that we are going to talk about is the Lucan text. So I encourage you to come back in three years' time when that text will come up once again in the lectionary, and I will definitely tackle this uh, wrestling text, actually, if you check it out, it's very interesting, the one about Jacob getting in a wrestling match. So if you are very excited about that, I apologize, but today it's the Gospel of Luke. Will God find justice on earth? What will God find on earth? The question to the disciples might startle us this morning. 
think it must have startled those disciples in the first century. Will God find faith on earth is the question. Ask boldly, live justly, our national church invites us this week. To give some historical context, we have to first recollect that the eschatological belief differences of the people from 2,000 years ago are way different than ours. That is, the way we think about the end of the world, the end times. The way that we think about this judgment day or the end of humankind is not the same at all as the people who were listening to Jesus 2,000 years ago. You might be thinking, oh gosh, I didn't even know our church had a way of thinking about Judgment Day. We don't seem like that kind of church. Well, it's part of our Christian history, so yeah, our church does have some, have some stuff to say about it. The fact of the matter is that each United Church of Christ congregation here in the state and even within our church, each of us individually have different ways of thinking about this topic of the Judgment Day. We don't all believe the same thing. Generally speaking, there are very few people who see Judgment Day or the finality of humankind in a way that many more theologically conservative Christian groups do. That is, sometimes with visions of Christ coming in a certain manner of glory, a certain image, a certain way, and sometimes even at a very specific time. That's not the theology that we have relating to eschatology or the end times. The general eschatology of our church, both national and local, aligns more with reflections on how and why we are accountable to God, knowing that God is with us on a day-to-day -day basis, knowing that much of the sacred text identifies God is in each other. God has come and been revealed to us in Jesus. And so we are accountable to God. Again, this is a general note. There could be churches throughout the United States that are UCC that believe in a different way. But it's important for us to discuss this. We have something in our church called freedom of conscience. And this means that we are welcome as individuals to interpret the Gospels and the text in whatever way is suitable for our particular situation or circumstance. We do this alongside prayer, reading theological interpretations throughout history, and we do so honoring the experiences of the people around us and the stories of the people around us. Now, for people of the ancient Near East, these folks who heard Jesus 2,000 years ago, the people who Jesus addressed, well, the freedom of conscience idea, it would not be present for them. For us to imagine that they had that type of a framework for looking or listening to Jesus, that would be grossly anachronistic. It would be like us thinking that the disciples had smartphones, or us thinking the disciples had wristwatches, they did not. The people of the first century, unlike us, believed that the arrival of the coming kingdom, well, it was an imminent event, like times when we wait for a big blizzard to pass. Having heard that meteorologists expect this to be the worst one yet, I understand that 78 was the really bad one, right, I think. These are the times that are similar to how they would have been believing in this coming kingdom. As we know the belief differences between ourselves and the people from 2,000 years ago, we can approach the text with a respect for the ways that we are situated with Christ's teachings in contrast to the people of the first century. And the people throughout our faith ancestry have each had their own perspective. We might imagine those who were pre- or post-Enlightenment, for example. Likely, it was the influence of the Enlightenment time that then led to this freedom of conscience. So our eschatological understanding, how we think about the end times of this century, invites us to ways that we may imagine what the gospel word is doing for us. So the faithful word that Jesus offered 
that I think parallels for people from the first century and us. Will God find faith here on earth? How might God find faith here? Ask boldly, live justly. In the parable, we might identify a characteristic many of us have to a lesser or a greater value, one that is with that widow that we hear about. The widow is, you know, persistent. You've probably heard she's persistent. Of course, some of us have often or at times wanted to quit. Some of us have quit because we do not have faith in ourselves or in the community around us. Some of us persist because we have no choice but but to persist. Just this past week, I heard this very word articulated so clearly by someone who was yet a passerby of our congregation. This person said, I just got to keep going no matter what. She had not had positive experiences in her life, and yet there was a certain giving away of herself to the situations that might come before her, a certain subtle persistence that she had to have. I would guess that some of y'all also have that in life. One thing that I want us to mostly consider today is not only the persistence that we might have in life, but is the fact that God is the one who is always persistent. It might not seem like it in our world right now, but God will indeed grant justice. The persistence of the divine goes beyond human comprehension, is a mysterious one that we can only try to begin to understand. Scholars agree that the parable we've heard this morning does not have one meaning. It has many. Margaret Ernst Habib writes, the parable of the persistent widow and the unjust judge with its Luke and introductory and its closing sentence to such a rich theological resource for us, consisting of so many layers that even finding a starting point can be a challenging task. And yet, there are so many ways for us to find ourselves in the story. And so I repeat the vague questions that the gospel has given to us this day. Will God find faith here on earth or in your life? If so, how? I want to suggest something pretty simple that is scattered throughout the Hebrew Bible and all of the gospel teachings and the epistles. God will grant justice. This is an eschatology called already but not yet. We've seen some work being done here on earth, but it's not all done. And we are called to be a part of that. In this text here, there's a clear, implicit message that God's action is the action that we might focus on, God's persistence. As some of you know, I had the opportunity to travel to Memphis a couple of weeks ago as part of a program to which many of you helped me gain admittance. The staff of what's called the Next Generation Leadership Initiative decided that the group I was with would travel to Memphis very intentionally so that our group would have the humbling experience and opportunity to visit the National Civil Rights Museum, the same place where Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, if you haven't been. The National Civil Rights Museum is built on the back of the Lorraine Motel, the place where King was killed in 1968. By the time that King was assassinated, he had predicted that he only had some time left in this human realm, See, King had made many people uncomfortable at this point, calling out the status quo time and again, naming that the Civil Rights Act had been passed but not yet actualized. That's that already but not yet eschatology. Status quo, not working, he told everyone, naming that the moral arc of the universe indeed bends towards justice and naming God's action in that. Again, the words of Ernst Habib, the scholar. God's love is so sovereign and unshakable that we can trust in this God to bring about justice. We can be sure that God hears our prayers day and night as we cry, even though we may not have seen results yet. God will grant justice. 
We are invited to become a part of this. That is the big call. We may not feel that the moral arc is moving, but we can be sure that it will and that we should be a part of this. Just yesterday at our church's statewide annual meeting, a large contingent of people from throughout the New Hampshire conference, local churches like ours gathered, and we sent some votes forward to the floor so that our church would join in some of these efforts for justice. First, our communities came together to commit to moving our local churches towards being free from plastic. Of course, making exceptions for situations regarding disabilities, health, and homelessness. This free from plastic resolution will challenge local churches like ours throughout the state to ask hard questions about changing our cultures of too often relying on disposables. Next, our churches voted on a resolution for all our communities to reaffirm the rights of individuals to bodily autonomy, especially reproductive rights. And finally, our church voted to support the worth and dignity of transgender people within both church and all of society, which as many of you know, has been at great risk throughout New Hampshire and all of the country. God will grant justice. We have opportunities, not just here in our church, but to look more broadly, joining other churches throughout the state and the nation. Each day this week, if we are struggling, let us be reminded of God's persistence, not only to challenge us to push the moral arc towards justice, but let us remember that the faith ancestry has come before us letting us all know that we are called into this belovedness to be named as God's own child. And know that the mysterious love of God has been set, set before us to envelop us and protect us no matter what. I pray that it will be so for us this week. We'd like to invite you to join us in singing hymn number 459. It's in the black hymnal. <coughs> and if you would like, we invite you to rise as you're able and led. Please be seated. 
We'd like to invite you into a time of prayer, whether you're here in our sanctuary or you're at home on Facebook or catching us even on television. If you are on Facebook, we always try to let you know that it's just fine and great to put prayers in the comments, but we always want to let you know that it's not a private place, so if it's personal, you might want to send an email to our office instead. It's office at uccplymouth.org. We do have a, a list in our bulletin of folks who are either having a hard time or they're seeking prayers for a change or a joy in their life, so we invite you to review the list of people who are in the bulletin. If you have um, something you'd like for us to add to that or you want us to send a card to someone um, or you simply want us to hold something in prayer, we have yellow um, cards in the pews. You can always write a note on there and then place it in the offering basket as they pass. There are often things that we bring into the sanctuary that are not listed, uh, things that are in our hearts, but we would like to voice, and so we'd like to open that space up for people. Does anyone have anything they'd like to bring before the gathered body here? Yes, Alice. Okay, her name is Etta, correct? Etta Stanley. And can you, what's the name of the virus? I think it's called Entero. Entero, and it affects young children. Okay, so her name is Etta Stanley. So I say, oh God, in your grace and mercy, hear your people at prayer. That may be it for this morning. Um, it, it was a joy yesterday to be together with uh, the gathered body of the churches from out throughout the state. It was the first time since the pandemic. So really, you know, um, thanks to any conference staff who might notice this video on Facebook, um, or if any of you know any of them, it, it was a, I would say it was a success because we were able to have it. I know many people longed for that in-person experience. So, um, you know, gratitude to the people who made that happen. And also we had one congregant, um, so grateful to Sam Lovett for being there yesterday. So it was great to see him there. Uh, oh God, in your grace and mercy, hear your people at prayer. Let's turn to God in silence. God of many names, you have granted us leaders in our church and community who work for the sake of justice and work so that we can all express our faith. For lay leaders of this year church, we are so grateful. Today we also lift up special gratitude for the work of Voices Against Violence, for all nine staff people and all people who offer support to their agency. While we hope that one day their work will not be needed, we are grateful that they are diligent to care for some who are the very most in need. God, we also turn to you with gratitude for this season of change, which our children have so wonderfully taught us about once again, reminding us of parts of life that can be so hard but so necessary. God, let us turn to each other for support when change becomes overwhelming. Hear our gratitude, O Holy One. We're holding all of those before you who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, and for those who are filled with joy and hope today, perhaps new beginnings in life that provide excitement. God, we know that justice will come in your time, and we ask for your challenge to become a part of our full selves. Let us ask ourselves hard questions about how we might follow up on the calls of our larger church both state and national? How might we encourage others to vote who have voiced uncertainty in our democracy? Let us find resolve and recommit to impacting changes that we truly can. 
God, to these petitions, we add prayers for those who are persecuted and harmed by oppression, by war, and by hunger in a world that does indeed have enough food. We pray for the women of Iran, especially the friends and family of Masha Amini, for all of those who are working to seek justice in that region. God, we're praying for an end to violence, for an end to racist policies, for an end to white supremacy, and for a call that each of us, all of us, will care for your earth. God, be with all of those who are public servants. Let them act with justice, with faith, and with mercy. God, we pray that we will all work to break down barriers to health care of all forms, especially those in our country which have regressed since the 1980s and 90s. God, we include reproductive health care. Let people, let families be able to take care of themselves. God, we pray for people who live outside and in shelters, for people who do not feel safe at home, for people who struggle with addiction, for people who struggle with mental health, and for all of those who are supporting them. God, let us recall your words, for you said, be watchful then and strengthen the things that remain. Holy One, let us know that we are hidden by your great shadow indeed, and give us your charge on this day. So hear us now as we faithfully utter the words that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we collect our offering this morning, we're going to hear about an agency that our church community has supported for many years. I don't actually know the number of years, but I know it's been a lot. Uh, I would like to welcome Meg Kennedy Dugan to the chancel. Come on forward, Meg. And um, I think that microphone right there is on. She's the executive director of Voices Against Violence, a very important agency in our community, and she's going to tell us a bit more about Voices. Meg, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for allowing me to be here today. Um, as mentioned, I'm the executive director of Voices Against Violence, and I've had the honor of being in that role for the last 10 years. This year uh, marks 40 years for Voices that we've served all of our local communities. Would like to say that we're celebrating our anniversary, but as mentioned before, our biggest hope, of course, is that we would be put out of business because there'd no longer be any abuse or any violence. We are your local crisis center, so we work to support survivors of domestic and sexual violence, stalking, human trafficking, and bullying. I thought I would just read a quote from somebody who had used our services recently because I think it says more eloquently than I could a little bit about the work the Voices does. Victim is an ugly word to me. Domestic violence is something that happens to weak women. Women in abusive relationships must see signs of abusive, abusiveness before they are hit. These are lies I always believed until it happened to me. I became a victim of domestic assault. I was scared to death what would happen if they didn't catch my abuser. Did the kids hear the argument or the assault itself? What do I do now? The police were very kind, but I was bombarded with questions, so many questions, that I felt sick to my stomach with fear and anxiety. The police handed me brochures with information. I took the pamphlets and papers, was feeling confused and defeated, and I went home and cried myself to sleep. The next day, I contacted Voices. With my eyes swollen shut and my bruised face, 
pride list with a million questions I showed up and met my advocate. But she didn't look at me as somebody who was a powerless victim, but somebody with rights, and more importantly, one among many. I was not alone. Things started to make sense to me, and the advocate helped me through a litany of paperwork. I was told I could call the center 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and somebody would always be there. Over the coming weeks, I had an advocate who went to court with me and explained everything and worked with not only myself but my children to create a safety plan. With voices, I know I will always have people who care about me and that I'll never be alone. For right now, that's all I know and that's all I need to know. The mission of Voices is to break the cycle of violence and create social change through education. We provide assistance to survivors, their families, friends, co-workers, related agencies throughout 21 towns in eastern Grafton County. We do that in a variety of ways. We have a 24-hour hotline that we always say to people, you don't have to call, you don't have to be in crisis to call. We are there for you whenever you need support. We also have a confidential shelter, which means that it's in a hidden location and that it's for people who are fleeing. We have people, families who show up in the middle of the night because they are afraid and we provide them that kind of refuge and safety that they're seeking. We also work very closely with uh, Spear Memorial Hospital. Anytime somebody comes in who's been a sexual assault victim, they call us, and again, no matter when it is, it could be two o'clock in the morning or Sunday afternoon, we show up and we're there, and then they're able to say to the person, I have an advocate right here right outside the door who'd like to talk to you if that's okay with you. At court, whenever somebody applies for a restraining order, court calls us up and lets us know that there's somebody there. We go down and if a person would like to talk with us, get some additional help, we're there for them. Every year, Voices has contact with usually between seven and 800 people in our local area and this last year was no exception. We provided services to 711 individuals, including 136 teens and children. I could go on and on about the services we provide, and I, I won't um, do that, but I want you to know that there's always help and support out there. We, like all of the other crisis centers in New Hampshire, work on an empowerment model which means we don't give advice, we don't tell somebody what they need to do or they should do, we listen to them, we don't judge them, and we say we're here for you. Here are all your possible options and whatever you choose to do, we will be here for you. I'm so lucky to work with such an incredible, um, very small but very dedicated staff in this kind of work, you, you don't become a multimillionaire and you don't have all kinds of amazing benefits, but just the reward of being able to help itself is so meaningful to our staff that we're incredibly lucky and we have staff who have been there 14, 15, 16 years continuing to serve everyone. Last year, we also did um, presentations and programs, trainings to the community, and we presented last year to over 3,000 children and adults on related issues. Now more than ever for Voice, it's just important for us to let people know that there is help out there, there is support, and whether you want to call us anonymously, one of, if you want to use one of our newfangled technology that we um, developed as a, result, as a result of the pandemic, which is confidential web chat or web texting, or if you want to come by in person, there's always somebody there to help and support who will not judge you. So thank you again for letting me come here today. We've 
And thank you for all of your years and years of support for Voices. We truly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Meg, for being here this morning. We really appreciate you taking time on the weekend to be with us. And I, did anyone who's been here for a long time know how many years we've been, we've kind of been partners? I think it's been over 10 for sure. I think it's been a while because I've seen plaques um, downstairs. Do you happen to know? Okay, yeah. Paulo? Uh, yeah. So at le probably at least 10 years or so, so maybe more. Um, thank you so much, Meg, for being here. We really appreciate it, too. The work is critical. And, um, and yeah, we, we use your resources here as a part of some of the services that we end up just you know, needing in the community. So thank you for what y'all do and for being a part of the Plymouth, the Plymouth, um, the Plymouth and the Lakes region uh, work to, to give justice to people. Um, if you're at home and you want to learn about how to give to our church, which does annually support Voices Against Violence, you can go to uccplymouth.org forward slash give to learn more about online giving. If you're at home and you're going to send us a check, Make sure you send it to our post office box, it's number 86, rather than our physical address, just to make sure it doesn't get lost. And um, if you're here in church, please, we invite you to join us in this mission to bring justice and peace throughout all of the world. Uh, if you are here and you're unable to contribute financially, it's okay. You can always put your hand out towards the basket and imagine that thing that you might give to someone this week that they need, be it a hug, a smile, or, uh, or something like that. So join us in giving this week.
Heavenly Creator, thank you for meeting our needs, of which we are unaware. Your holy word encourages us to give honor to you with the first fruits of our wealth. Challenge our minds, hearts, and souls to meet this sacred word. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship. Multiply what we give so that your realm will grow here on earth, that children will not grow hungry and homeless, that the lonely will have the outreach they need, and that the widows will receive the full care they need. May Christ dwell in our hearts so that we will be rooted in love. Amen. This week, remember that God is persistently seeking justice and seeking to show you that you are beloved. So, as you go tend the sick, share a meal, even if from afar or over the phone. If people ask you where you've come from, say to them that you're God's child and that you have seen love in Christ. Please be seated. 